now we are going to begin an important sequence on quantum mechanical scattering. And I don't think the point is going to be a deep dive into all the aspects of non-relativistic scattering, but it is going to get the touch on the parts that are most relevant for QED, right? This is sort of prerequisites to QED. And scattering is a big problem for those who are beginning their study of QED because there are fundamental ideas, for example, plane waves and partial wave expansions that students sometimes learned a little bit by rote and didn't actually kind of dig into owning the subject. And that's just, this is just the introduction ideas. There's a lot of others, mostly the time dependent method of discovering scattering, right? Not the time independent method, but the time dependent method. However, so we're going to try to cover some of these key topics, but we will begin with just something nice and simple. The partial wave expansion notion, we're going to be able to attack the idea of phase shifts. And um, we're going to do this using the time-independent Schrodinger wave equation. And as soon as you look at that, you immediately must think, okay, whatever I get as an answer, I know that the real answer, which is this wave function as a, a function of space and time, is going to be the answer we get from the time-independent method multiplied by e to the minus, I guess, what, i omega n of t. And this will be you know, one given uh, eigenfunction of all this. So we always remember when we see this time-independent thing that we're making the presumption that we're going to solve this in the energy eigenstates basis, the basis of energy eigenstates, and the time dependence is all wrapped up in this nice oscillating function, which is why this is such a useful method, right? So when we see that, immediately think this and realize you're solving just for this spatial part. And of course, what's important to remember about all that is that this whole story is all told in the Schrodinger picture. And that's another thing that we're going to have to attack before we get into QED is the different pictures, the Schrodinger picture, the Heisenberg picture, and the interaction picture. And this scattering is a great place to tease apart those three differences, which become very important in QED. So the point is, is we are going to attack this time-independent Schrodinger equation for a free particle, a free particle, which means you'll see that there's no, there's going to be no potential inside of the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is just this kinetic part, and it's equal to the energy eigenvalue, which will be a continuous eigenvalue, times the, uh, the wave function on both sides. And then we apply our transformation of these units so we can create this structure as just k squared, which is going to be the wave number squared. Now, getting really facile with these units is very important. I'll, I'll put up a, a a bit of a screenshot in a moment of getting all the units straight away. But this wave number, that really is effectively what you want to think about as the uh, the square root of the energy, right? So there's a very direct connect. Oh, well, obviously this, the square, let's see, the square root of this is what K is, right? Now, in order to deal with a partial wave expansion, the, the solution for this for, for, in the Cartesian coordinates is just plane waves. And that's something we've, we've already done that actually. We've actually looked at plane waves in the earlier lecture and we realized that they were not actually members of the space of solutions of the Schrodinger equation. They're not, well, they're definitely, okay, let me make that clear. They are solutions to the Schrodinger wave equation, but they're not members of the Hilbert space of realizable states of our particle. But we kind of understand how we use them anyway. So when we look at this, we can think of this as the solutions, or we can think of this, no, no, we're going to make wave packets. And in the time-independent formulation, we don't use generally wave packets. They typically will, you'll typically see books and, and, and presentations of this where we're looking at the plane wave solutions, despite the fact that they're not physically realizable solutions, because we know we can build physically realizable solutions from them. So the plane waves exist, but now we're going to take advantage of the spherical symmetry of space, and we're going to do this problem in spherical coordinates. 
And this is the first place that students kind of detach a bit from the material, right? Is this version of the Laplacian, right? This version of this Laplacian operator, which is sometimes written with an, uh, just a regular triangle, um, it, it looks like quite a mess, right? You have got these trigonometric functions in the denominator, which, by the way, could have been put in the numerator, right? I've always kind of wondered why they didn't go with cosecant squared and, and cosecant here. I do, I think I now, I, I know the reason is just you're later going to make a substitution where you're just going to turn it back into sign anyway. But this is the, you sh every student should have at some point in their time uh, working on this material have derived this Laplacian, meaning you've got, you've done the conversion from Cartesian coordinates to spherical coordinates by hand, and you own this object. So when you look at this, as messy as it looks like, you know, with derivatives of products of things, including derivatives, you understand exactly why it is the way it is. So that's a, an assignment for everybody if you haven't actually done it. I don't think you need to do it again if you've done it once, but you definitely need to understand how to write down, write down these expressions that convert spherical coordinates to Cartesian coordinates and invert them, right? Invert them for uh, uh, writing, um, well, this is Cartesian coordinates in terms of spherical coordinates, so you want to invert it, so you want to be able to write, you want to be able to write both of these, right? And then you take the appropriate derivatives of these things, plug it into the Laplacian, and you should end up getting this guy. But you have to decide how much mathematical physics do you want to go into once you've done this. Because if you look at this, you should know right away, oh, well, the solution to this is the spherical harmonics times a radial wave function that is depending on solving the so-called radial equation. That's pretty high-level stuff, right? Because what you're saying is, I already know that the solution to this differential equation is, well, the solution is separable, and the equation is separable. So if I assume a solution in the forms of the product of three functions, each a function only of one of the coordinates, I know that because this is a spherically symmetric problem and because this is the Laplacian and this is the Helmholtz equation, I know that if I plug this in, I'm going to get three ordinary differential equations and uh, I know that the solution to the two angular ones are going to be the spherical harmonics. I don't know quite what the solution is to the radial one, because that will change for each particular problem. But in this particular case, oh, I remember that the solution to this is simply the uh, spherical Bessel functions, and understanding the boundary conditions, I can figure out this just by looking at it, right? So that's sort of the cursory way. You, that's saying, I've already done this problem. I know the answer, right? And great. That's, that, if that's where you're at, it's just skip this lecture because we're actually going to own the answer by kind of going through it. What worries me the most is that people don't really appreciate where these constants become integers, LL plus 1 and M, M squared. The separation constants becoming integers is really important because that is the quantization, right, of these functions. And understanding exactly why is important. So we're going to derive this to, to get at why these functions are inter, integers, why these separation constants are, are, are as they are. And uh, we'll go about that deep into the analysis. Okay, so then the goal being that we're going to be able to express our free particle in a basis of eigenstates that are expressed through the angular momentum eigenvalues. All right, so let's begin. So as I promised, this is a quick review of all the possible crazy combinations of units. It's funny, I find myself drawing this up, writing this up every now and then, or go, referring to it. Uh, once you work with these things, everything becomes very uh, instinctual and habitual. But when you put yourself aside and you work with other you know, if you work in, the, in general relativity, you, you you don't think too much about h bar omega for a few years. So you kind of have to always go back. But anyway, these relationships are the relationships that should be quite second nature.
to any student who's really interested in digging into QED, especially because, you know, you'll see books using all these different formalisms. Some books never actually use the wave number. They always stick with energy. You know, there's not too many, but it does happen, especially if you use some older books. And I like some of the older books. Okay, so that's these are the constants. I'll just leave them up there and then uh, we'll move on. All right, so now we'll begin with the actual solution of all this. First of all, this is the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. That sub t is represents a single derivative with respect to time. And this is the obviously the wave function that we're going to write in fully separated form. Things to remember about this is that v is actually an operator. This thing is an operator on psi. And when we study scattering, especially if we study uh, scattering that's really related to nucleon-nucleon scattering, this operator will change psi. Very typically, we treat it as just sort of an energy, uh, a real number form of energy. And, but in more sophisticated treatments, like, well, in, in spin-orbit coupling, right, that operator becomes L dot S, which is an actual no-kidding operator. So, uh, it is important to understand that uh, V is an operator. Now, the thing that's good for what we're doing now is we're dealing with the free particles. So this just goes to zero, right? There are no forces uh, acting on our particle. And in the classical sense, don't forget the force, forces are related to uh, the change of potential with, uh, well, let's see, the, deri the spatial derivatives of the potential. So what we're really saying in here when we do potentials, and we t we'll talk about this later, is, is what are all the forces acting on the particle? They may be too hard to figure out, but if you can estimate a potential, the potential kind of has within it all of the forces. So this becomes a model of interactions, micro-interactions that are regarding literal forces, which involve in QED the exchange of photons or, or QCD, the exchange of gluons or the weak interaction, this exchange of those Z and W bosons. So using this is almost a, an immediate approximation of things, of microphysics we don't understand. But the good news is we're getting it to zero and all that's left is the kinetic energy. And then this is the process I mentioned a little bit earlier is we can write the operator for uh, uh, the momentum uh, in this form, right? This is just the operator form of momentum. And this is in Cartesian format. So if we use our conversions of Cartesian to polar coordinates, we can write this momentum operator in polar form. And now you start seeing these cool terms showing up. I really love these terms, by the way. Um, uh, this is sort of silly to have theta in parentheses here. I, I should clean that up in my, in my LaTeX. Uh, I, I guess it's pronounced LaTeX. Right. Somebody said I, I actually said latex once and I got harassed and uh, I realized they're absolutely right. It's not latex. It's latex or latex. But uh, I go with latex. So it's I'll fix up my latex. See, this is silly. I only like parentheses when it really matters. It's implied completely by the structure of this that the sign would only act on theta. In fact, I didn't even do it down here. Right. Anyway, using this, you can quickly calculate p squared, which is exactly what we want. And uh, that is how you end up owning this thing, right? So once you own this thing, we're now going to move into the time independent formulation, which is just going to be um, uh, the, the kinetic energy minus the energy times the fully separated wave function, right? So this fully separated wave function that is psi of r, theta, and phi, right? And psi is a wave function, right? So now we're, we're actually using the wave function formalism. We're not using the Dirac formalism here. So this is why we did those first lessons, is when you look at this, you should immediately be able to think in your mind, well, okay, what is this in the Dirac formalism? You should, you should be able to flow between those so easily. And in fact, I think it's worth a brief pause to just reflect on that. So we consider our abstract vector space contains an eigenstate of this free Hamiltonian, and that eigenstate has a momentum p, 
right? Then we just use our operator whose value can never be overstated, right? What did we call that? I think we called it the Yokozi operator. You can't overstate its importance, right? <laughs> That's from Sakurai. And then you, you insert this complete set of states of R, theta, and phi on P, right? And you integrate over all of the volume. And uh, this guy right here, that's the wave function, right, of r, theta, and phi associated with the eigenvalue p. So uh, this guy here, right, that is the wave function we're talking about, right? So that this is the sort of and, – and everything else just becomes a bit of the skeleton of it. So it turns out that if you just work with this guy – you, uh, you'll get all of the same results. So that's just a reminder of how we connect our wave functions to our abstract eigenstates. Okay, so let's return to what we were doing. So we have just separated, right? We've just taken our wave function and separated it into three functions of r, theta, and phi. And this should be pretty rote stuff, right? Once we've done that, we end up just taking our operator with our separated wave function, and then there's the, uh, the energy eigenvalue with its separated wave function, and we run this wave function into this thing. Now, the only thing that happens notationally that's a bit of a mess is these guys are each functions of just one variable, right? It's R of R, for example. It's capital theta of theta. So ultimately, when we take these derivatives, it, they're partial derivatives of this whole thing, indeed, but they're, they become ordinary derivatives of the individual forms, of the individual factors. And that's important because that's the whole point of separation of variables. You're taking this differential equation that's a partial differential equation, and you're converting it into uh, uh, ordinary differential equation. So I just couldn't help but doing this quick conversion just to show that the differential form of the orbital angular momentum operator is kind of buried right in here. Once you pull out this r squared term and you clear this fraction here, uh, the l squared, the differential form of the angular momentum operator appears. So that's kind of fun to see. And you should be able to see that. You should know how that works. You can go back to the earlier video we did on uh, the earlier lesson we did on the angular momentum operator differential form, and you'll see that it's right here without the r squared, and it's defined with an extra h bar and a minus sign and all that. Uh, well, no, I think the minus sign came from here. But uh, anyway, uh, leaving that behind, we now actually, after we clear the h bar over true m, now everything is in terms of the wave number. So the wave number appears, and now our differential equation looks like this. Where we've start, where we've peeled off the relevant derivatives, partial derivatives, and these are now ordinary derivatives. So this r sub r, that's an ordinary derivative, meant to mean dr dr, and it's actually a little pointless because if we had just written say r prime, there's only one variable to take a derivative of, right? And so that would be wouldn't be ambiguous. But we're still going to use this sort of partial derivative notation just because it's pretty typical to, to do in, in most treatments. Just remember, you know, the partial derivatives are already gone at this stage. So now the next step is just to sort of work this equation to try to separate all the terms with respect to r in one place and all the angular terms in another place. And that's pretty easy. You just divide through by uh, r theta phi and it works out pretty well. The r is completely separated at this point. All the, all the expressions that depend on r are completely separated here, and all the expressions that involve the two angular variables are separated in this term. Notice the angular variables aren't completely separated among themselves yet because you've got this sine squared theta mixed with phi terms, uh, although this part's all theta. So once you've got this, now you execute this notion of separation by making the observation that uh, if this thing's going to always equal zero, clearly this and this have to uh, equal the same constant. And that will, uh, uh, that's, the, that's, that's why we're doing this, of course. Now this next step, what did I do in this next step? 
here. I think, uh, oh, I expanded out this derivative using the product rule. Here I actually couldn't resist, so I threw this down as the cotangent because this first, the, the derivative of sine theta with respect to theta is cosine, so you end up with a cosine over sine, so I just threw that down as a cotangent. You end up with this second derivative of theta there, and you still have this sine squared part over here. So all we did between these two steps is blow up this this uh, uh, derivative with respect to the polar angle. Theta is the polar angle, phi is the azimuthal angle, and r is the radial coordinate. So we have the polar coordinate, the azimuthal coordinate, and the radial coordinate. So now uh, uh, we move to the next phase. What did I do in the next phase? Um, uh, the next phase I didn't do much. I, I guess I just took this notation and I blew it up so it looked like partial derivatives again. I wonder why I did that. I, I'm just obviously just sort of doing this by hand as though you would do it by hand. I, I find that more natural than going through some kind of weird textbook calculation. I guess the, the point is is to show the notation here, just to highlight the notation. But if I did that, then it's really bad because this clearly should be an ordinary derivative, right? Those are ordinary derivatives. These are no longer, it would be, it's inexcusable at this point to use partial derivatives here. Even here, that's not excusable, right? So all of those should have been ordinary derivatives. That's very important. So then uh, I changed the notation again because I just love to change notation. That's just my thing. Oh, but what I really did here is I just actually did the, uh, did the separation, right? So I put this guy on the left side of the equation and then um, uh, uh, made it equal c. And this guy goes on the right side, but it ends up equaling minus c. Because once it's on the right side, it gets a nine, minus sign. So the, mi the, negative of this, the negative of this expression here ends up equaling c. So that expression just equals minus c. Now notice I just put in c here, right? That's sort of the point of what we're doing. Very frequently in texts that do this work, you immediately see them say, oh, for, con for later convenience, we're going to put in LL plus 1. But I don't play with that, right? Because later convenience means that they're kind of dropping something in that later you're not going to fully benefit from realizing. It's important to discover these things from scratch, right? This was all done by some 19th century mathematician, right? This is old news. But the beauty of all of this is by walking through it yourself, you're literally kind of rediscovering the fascination. If, if When I first learned about separation of variables, I was completely blown away. I was like, wow, this is really clever. This is really fun to walk through and see what these guys did in the 19th century to solve these kinds of equations. And to repeat it, you're literally getting a new sense of discovery. It's like, it's like the Grand Canyon is a place that was discovered by somebody and it must have blown them away. But when you first say, oh, I've heard there's a place called the Grand Canyon and you follow the tracks and you go there and you see it for yourself, you're like, you're just as blown away just because you didn't literally, you aren't the very first guy to see it. It's just as fun. So if you put LL plus one there, you take all the fun out of it, right? That's the way I look at this. Anyway, uh, enough of the rant. So we will keep going. So I take this, now I blow up I blow up this partial, what I have written as a partial derivative, but should be, understand this should be, this is an ordinary derivative at this point. Um, I guess that's lazy LaTeX, right? Um, because clearly I'm cutting and pasting from previous things, right? Uh, which is why I use LaTeX, because once you do start LaTeX, cutting and pasting is almost faster than writing things down, I think. Anyway, once you blow it up, you use the product rule, and this, uh, you, you can maneuver very quickly into this form right here, right? And this becomes uh, the relevant, this is the radial equation that you're looking for. And we'll talk about it a little bit. It's not in its most final form because this, anybody who looks at this is going to say, oh, wait a minute, I recognize that radial equation. It's the equation for spherical Bessel functions. It's not quite the equation for spherical Bessel functions because this term here should only be r squared 
if it is. The fact that that K is there kind of ruins it. However, a quick change of variables, and it, it's so close to being the spherical Bessel function that I'm actually willing to stop there, right? Uh, doing a conversion to, say, um, uh, what would it pick a variable like S equals K and R, right? And then making a change of variables, you end up basically with S squared 2S, S squared minus CR equals zero, right? But the point I'm trying to make is when you land here, as a student of this subject, you can say, okay, that's the spherical Bessel function uh, equation. I know the solutions. They're the spherical Bessel functions. I know the general structure of those solutions because I've got books that tell me. I've got canonical sources like, like uh, the, the tables that exist at the National Institute of Standards or the particular book I'm using defines them this way. And I don't need to solve this thing because it's already been solved by some 19th century mathematician, right? I guess I'm going to guess it was Bessel, right? It's named after him, but, you know, who knows what the history is. But um, uh, at some point, though, you know, students of mathematical physics are going to have to solve these things to get that experience, right? Anyway, so that's one of the differential equations that we're staring down. And let's see what happens next. Well, what happens next is you now look at the other side of the separation, right? This side. And you're going to try to separate the azimuthal coordinate from the polar coordinate, which is very easily done. Multiply through by sine squared, and you end up, uh, you know, canceling here, and it, it ends up being this guy, right? Everything on the left is azimuthal. Everything on the right is polar. We already know uh, one constant of separation slips in there, right? We haven't figured out what this constant is. So like I said, I'm alerting you because if you read this in another book, when you get to this point, you're going to see an L, L plus 1 already waiting for you there, right? But we're not doing that. We're leaving it as C. So now you have this, but now you have to introduce yet another constant, and this guy and this guy will both equal this uh, constant and, and the opposite of the constant. By the way, if it's unclear to you why you can go from this statement to this statement and this statement, um, that's a problem. You really need to understand why in separations of variables that works. Uh, I, I feel the need to, to explain it, although I don't want to insult anybody's intelligence who's here for something slightly more advanced, but the point being that uh, this is all a function of phi, and this is all a function of theta. If you change theta, this is going to change. This will not. The only way that can work is if both sides are equal to a constant. Okay? So, fa fa that's as far as I'll go in with that. But you end up with this differential equation right here and this differential equation right here. And now you have three differential equations, and they're all ordinary differential equations because I should be using ordinary uh, different uh, derivatives. And those are the three differential equations that we have to work with. So we will start attacking them one by one. This is obviously the easiest one. Let's see, I've sort of scribbled out the, uh, the solution here. Um, this differential equation is elementary, so it goes without saying what the result is. The point we're trying to make is that D, right, this separation constant D, we're now going to impose the obvious rule that since we're dealing with a wave function that is a continuous function of R, theta, and phi, and once we've decided that this is some function of R, some function of the polar angle, and we've decided that it's some function of E to the I, M, phi, in order for this to be continuous, as phi goes around in circles, m, m must be an integer, right? It's pretty simple. And that forces, so the, con, it's, so the first boundary condition is this continuity of our wave function as the uh, azimuthal variable goes from 0 to 2 pi. And so in order to force this to equal itself, the only way is to force m to be an integer. So that takes care of our first, oh, and if m is an integer, then d, the separation constant, is m 
squared, right, is m squared. So that is the answer to this. So we've actually already solved for phi. And we already now know that d is, uh, is going to be given by m squared. So with this knowledge, with this knowledge of the value of d, we can now attack this the uh, uh, polar differential equation, which is an ordinary differential equation. And we know that the polar angle goes from, it goes from uh, 0 to pi, right? Remember, the azimuthal angle goes from 0 to 2 pi, or more, right? I mean, it, it's unconstrained, but the polar angle is pretty constrained between 0 and pi, inclusive, right? It includes 0 and it includes pi. So the sine of this can go from uh, 0 to 1. So now again, we have the pleasure of walking the ground of 19th century mathematicians. And they made note of this and their experience with this stuff told them that, hey, let's make the substitution x equals cosine theta into our differential equation. And then the function we're after, which is a function of theta, will actually now be some other function of x, which will literally be some other function of x, which is actually cosine theta. So we're going to try to rewrite the differential equation with this substitution. And it's a, it's a bit of a, of a walk, right? You know, if x equals cosine theta, we need to know what dx is. But once we know we're dealing with cosine theta, you know, we don't want a sine theta in there, so we have to write sine theta in terms of x, so we end up with using uh, the Pythagorean uh, rule uh, for, for the Pythagorean identity for trigonometric functions because we know that uh, sine of theta is the square root of 1 minus x squared because x squared is cosine theta, right? So then we just start figuring out all of these different derivatives that show up in the formula we're trying to solve, which is, which is where is it? which is this formula here, right? We need to get a first derivative of theta. We need to get a second derivative of theta. And then we need all these sine thetas. Everything's got to be converted to functions of x, right? And so, look, I hunt down the first derivative of theta using the chain rule. We get this. We hunt down the uh, uh, derivative of dx d theta in order to work the chain rule. We get this. To find the second derivative, we kind of do the same thing, which is just literally a big pain in the butt. But the second derivative of theta with respect to the polar angle is the second derivative of p with respect to x minus x times the first derivative of p. And it all works out using this substitution here. And so once I have all these parts, dx, d theta, d uh, theta, d, d capital theta, d theta, and d capital theta, second derivative of capital theta d theta, once I have all of those, I can substitute them all in to converting, I called it the azimuthal equation, but that's not right. It's this, we're calling, the, this is the polar equation, right? The polar equation. And I substitute it all into our polar equation and just start churning away. And look, I put in d as m squared, right? We have a minus d there. So I subtract the m squared because I know that it's already been quantized by the previous differential equation. And I guess I have a little p missing over here, right? And then um, just crunch and crunch and you end up right here. And again, you have the, the choice, right? We know that this is the associated Legendre differential equation. We know that because some 19th century mathematical genius probably Legendre, figured this out and uh, has solved it for us, right? So we know the answer to this are the associated Legendre polynomials, right? P, L, M. But that's, so that's not exactly true though, right? Because what the 19th century mathematicians figured out was a little deeper than, oh, the answer to this are the associated Legendre polynomials. The true way to say it is that one answer to this is the associated Legendre polynomials. You know, C, nothing here determines C yet. We have to kind of work to determine C. And the way we do this is we decide, okay, how deep do we want to go down this rabbit hole? And the answer is I want, I want to go down deep enough 
until I understand exactly why C equals L, L plus 1. I want to go that deep. Now, do I have to go all the way? Well, if you go deeper than this, you end up dealing with issues of just trying to figure out what's the best form of an answer. This is where the physics sort of stops, right here. So once you understand why C equals L, L plus 1, then it's okay. Let's go back to the reference books and uh, use their conventions for the functions that solve this equation the way we need it to be solved. So, so how does this work? All right, so let's, let's do that. Let's only solve this equation as deeply as we need to solve it to understand C equals L, L plus 1. So the first thing to capture when we look at this is that our solution to this equation is P of X. But we know that X is going to take all values on the interval from 0 to 1. So when we solve this for P, it's got to be finite. It's got to exist uh, on 0 and 1. It's got, it's got it's, it's to be bounded on this closed interval. And that fact is what makes all the difference in the solution. There are plenty of solutions to this with P, which P is not bounded on this interval. But none of those solutions are going to be physically meaningful for our problem. Only those solutions that are bounded on 0 to 1 matter. This is a different kind of issue than we just used for the as a muthal part of the wave function, which was just continuity of the function. It had to, it had to connect to itself between 0 and 2 pi. Uh, this boundedness is the new problem. So how are we going to solve this differential equation and make sure that the solutions we get are bounded on 0 to 1? Well, the way we're going to do this is we're going to walk the path of a 19th century mathematician and use the Frobenius method to attack the related differential equation where we set m equal to 0. Right? And that seems to be a little bit e easier looking equation. So we set m equal to 0, and we're going to use the Frobenius technique. And the first step of the Frobenius technique is to figure out where the singular points are and what point you want to solve this equation around. And we're going to choose x equals 0. And x equals 0 is an ordinary point to this equation. Right, there, This is not singular at x equals 0. The way you can test is you clear the you clear the coefficient of the first term, and then you look and ask, is this, does this thing diverge at the point that you're going to solve the equation around? And we're going to solve it at x equals 0, and this point, this coefficient does not diverge there, and neither does this one. So uh, since we're not doing this around us, now you can do this around a singular point, but we're not going to, but I have uh, seen people use the singular point technique, even though they're going it around, they're, they're solving it around zero. The point is, is if you're solving around an ordinary point, all you have to do now is substitute just some Taylor series for P, a Taylor series for the first derivative of P, and a Taylor series for the second derivative of P directly into the differential equation and solve. Actually, we're going to, we're going to substitute it back into this form up here. Now, if you're doing this around a singular point, what you'll end up seeing is you'll see a little s written up here, you know, uh, because there's an exponent associated with the singularity that you want to solve for, which uses a, which surfaces something called an indicial equation, right? An indicial equation. But because this is an ordinary point, there really is no indicial equation. If you did put that s in there, and some books do, even though they're solving around an ordinary point, some, some treatments do include this s, as though you always do it no matter what when the Frobenius method is used. But you end up with an initial equation that's trivial unless you're around an actual singular point. And it doesn't add anything. So we can just leave it out. So, so this is our Frobenius substitution. And then uh, here you can see I've executed the substitution. I hope I've done it correctly. Uh, I won't go through this term by term, but it, this is just substituting this expression here. That goes right there. This one here goes right there. And this one here goes right there. And notice eta, right? Eta is what we were calling C. I guess I should say that, right? Eta is what we were calling before this was, how did it look? It was 
you know, c minus m squared over 1 minus x. But we set this to 0 and c, and, and I used eta in our solution form because um, I think c was actually kind of making the typesetting weird for some reason, so I got rid of it and I went with eta. So we're solving for, we, we put all this stuff in, we expand this guy out, and then what we, we're doing is we're, um, we know this whole thing has to equal zero, so each exponent of x to the some power has to equal zero. And so uh, I probably inefficiently sort of tried to break these terms down so that all of the summations started at the same thing. And in order to do that, I had to um, pull out one term here and two terms from this summation, one term from this summation, two terms from this summation, in order to pull out these terms so that all the sums start at the same place. And then we just start uh, equating the powers of x. So for example, this is the zeroth power. So uh, uh, the, all the zero powers of x have to be equal. So there's a zero power of x from this term. There's a zero power of x here. There's no zero power of x here or here. So the zero power from this term plus the zero power from this term have to add together to be zero. So we know that the second coefficient of the series is minus eight over two times the zeroth coefficient of the series. And then we, I think we do the same thing for the first power, right? We get a first power term from this, no first power, no first power, no first power, but then two first power terms here. And uh, the linear terms give us that the a1 and a3 are related by this expression. So what we see right away is that the even terms are connected and the odd terms are connected. And that's really important because that are going to be the two independent solutions, possibly. And a0 and a1 are now arbitrary constants. But now we can make an expression for all the rest of the terms just by looking and comparing all the n plus 2 terms to the n terms. And... Uh, I work on, when I work it out, I end up right here. I get that the an plus two terms is this expression times the an term. And right there is sort of our answer, right? Because what we're going to discover is that this series will never terminate unless eta equals n times n plus one, where n n plus one is some integer, right? This is valid for both the even and odd sequence, right? So if eta if eta is ever of the form some integer times some integer plus one, then this numerator is going to go to zero, and a n plus two is going to equal zero, and then a n plus four is going to equal a bunch of stuff times a n plus two, which is zero, so all of the subsequent terms are going to be zero. So in some sense, at this point, we've accomplished our mission. We now understand why eta has to be LL plus one to terminate the sequence, but not quite so fast, right? I, I want to make it clear that why do we want to terminate the sequence? Well, we want to terminate the sequence because otherwise it would be unbounded at uh, 0 or 1, because at 0 or 1, th this expression here is, has a singular point. You do have a singular point. I'm sorry, I keep saying 0, 1. I, I guess I mean um, at minus 1 and 1, this thing has a singular point. Why did I say 0 or 1? Oh, I said 0 to 1 because I was thinking uh, I was thinking sine theta when theta goes from 0 to pi. But there's also the cosine theta part, which goes from... Uh, and, and here, this will go from... Uh, uh, 0 to 1, but this one, the cosine theta between 0 and pi will include both minus 1 and 1, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, we need it to be, we need it to be, um, uh, our, our function has to be bounded on minus 1 to 1, not 0 to 1, minus 1 to 1. And those two points are, in fact, singular points of this. So in order to keep it bounded in that region, we have to have eta to equal LL plus 1. And notice when eta equals LL plus 1, uh, only one of these two sequences, one, either because remember, the even sequence and the odd sequence are going to be separated. 
So only one of those two sequences will cancel. So the other one must be zero by virtue of either a0 being zero or a1 equaling zero. So if L is even, right, then uh, th a1 is gonna have to equal zero. And if L is odd, then a0 is gonna have to equal zero. Anyway, this is sort of where, where we're after. But the other thing to remember is, despite the fact that what is important to keep in mind is this just forces our solution to be bounded at those two particular points. It's very unique to be bounded. But if it wasn't an integer, right, if it was, if eight is not an integer, you still have to check to see if these coefficients so derived uh, will create a convergent solution when plugged back into this expression, right? It may very well be that it, that it still converges. It's not like our, our, our sequence goes to infinity, has an infinite number of terms, means it definitely diverges. It only diverges at minus one and one because those are singular points of this expression. Other non-integer things may still converge, and in fact, it does. It turns out that when you finally get to the answer and you kind of work through all of this sequencing, and, and, and look for the pattern and put the pattern together, which is what we're not going to do, and you kind of come up with this solution, uh, which um, is a co totally good solution, but um, it does in fact converge, except at minus one and one, but it will converge for any value of L. And so, uh, and so be it, right? Now, when you choose to use a value of L to be an integer, we can start using the Rodriguez formula to choose to see exactly what the polynomial looks like because it's terminating, right? So the answer is going to now be a polynomial. And uh, this is sort of the form that uh, you generally see. Sometimes you see x squared minus 1 to the L, and sometimes you see this minus 1 to the L pulled out to show its sign relationship to L, and it's left uh, 1 minus x squared to the L over here. So um, so that's as deep as we want to go. We want to see why we end up having these two things as L and L plus L plus 1 and M squared. And the rest of this stuff is just you got to commit yourself to some definition, some convention of the this is the Legendre polynomial. Because what we've done is we've taken the associated Legendre equation and turned it into the regular Legendre equation by setting m equals to zero. Which brings up the next point, though. It's like, wait a minute, what about the case where, so you solve this for m equals zero, what about the case when m is not equal to zero? And now again, you have to decide, do you want to dig into the solution? Do you want to go and follow the footsteps of a 19th century mathematician and understand that, yeah, I figured out PL as a function of, where now I've replaced X with cosine theta, right? I, I've, I've figured out the Legendre polynomials that'll work here, but I still don't know the solution of the associated Legendre equation, right? And how do I get that? So now you have to decide, how do you, how do you want to do that? Do you want to do the Frobenius method for that? Or do you want to go open up a book on mathematical physics and look at the answer and read about how the answer is done? And then if you read about it, do you want to actually execute it yourself, right? How far do you want to go? And the answer is you need to go as far as you feel until you feel like you own it, that you've, you've paid the price. It's part of your identity as a student. And, you know, you, you, you believe in it because you did it not because it was told to you. Remember, that's the idea of science is we're supposed to be able to reproduce everything. Now, you can't go into a lab and reproduce, say, Rutherford scattering experiments unless you happen to work in that kind of lab. Or if you're, But if you're a theoretician or a student of the theory, you can reproduce the steps that generate this solution. And in fact, I'm going to spend a few more minutes doing that or showing you how I did it so that you can decide if you want to go back and do the same analysis to get the same kind of commitment to understanding the answer. So now the question is, is knowing this answer when m equals zero, can we find a clever way of solving this when m does not equal zero? 
And when I say, can we find a way, what I really mean is, can we open up a book on mathematical physics, go to the chapter on the associated Legendre polynomials, which solve this thing, and understand what they're telling us about how to get from here to here, from the Legendre polynomials to the associated Legendre polynomials. So let's do that now. And I guess by now I mean next time because this lecture is already pretty long. But here's some examples of some good books. These are the kind of books that you need always at the ready. This is sort of the classic for physics students, Arfkin and Weber. And it does a pretty good job. The, the problem it does is it tries to cover so much material that it can be a little cursory sometimes, right? But it's a big book, so it covers a lot of material and it's a big book. So it's definitely a thing you must have. And it would have answered any of these questions that we talked about today. In fact, it kind of does so and it does so in a very good expository way. A little bit more advanced would be special functions and their applications. This is an example of a book. It's a, a little bit more mathematical and it gives you a little bit deeper answers into uh, why these things work the way they do. And another good book that I like that's actually kind of small, it's called The Functions of Mathematical Physics. It's not quite just a, a library of functions. It does give you some good lessons in there and it's a less expensive book. But these are the things that you have at your side that allow you to sort of walk the path of the 19th century mathematician. And uh, what we're gonna do in our next lesson is we're going to uh, use one of the walk the path, meaning that some 19th math century mathematician discovered an interesting insight and we're just gonna duplicate the implications of the insight. On the other hand, we're not going to try to accomplish the insight, which is a major problem that physics students have is, and I, I think I've said this before, is that they'll look at a problem, like they'll go way back to you know, the beginning here, and they'll say, well, goodness, look at this. This is a, a differential equation. I don't think I could have solved that myself, or worse, I don't think I would have realized that this was actually the same as this through a substitution. And because I'm not smart enough to have invented that myself, maybe this material is beyond me. And that is just wrong, right? Never think that because the idea that you should be able to reproduce all of the work that was ingeniously brilliant from the times of the ancient Greeks to the, you know, through the 19th century mathematicians to uh, all of uh, to the 20th century. I mean, there's no way you should be able to duplicate that from scratch. No one's ever going to give you a problem that says solve the hydrogen atom and uh, specify all of the energy eigenfunctions for every um, every possible state of the electron. Right? Nobody's ever going to ask you to do that. They're going. It's it's a lesson. Walking these this dog is a lesson about absorbing what they've taught. And it's learning what they've done. Now, there is a point where you've got to, you can't be passive about it. You've got to actively try to do it, which is why I kind of went through this exercise today. And we're going to actively go through the process of solving the rest of this in the next lesson. And we're going to do so using the insights from these books here, um, in particular, uh, this book here and this book here.